Hello students, welcome back to the course on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. Today we move to the last lecture of the last module and in fact the last class of the entire course. So today we were in the module 12 itself, we were looking into voice, employee voice and employee silence as I have re-emphasized on the importance of employee voice as well as knowledge hiding and sharing. I would like to conclude it by taking a session on strategies for fostering a safe environment at work. Now, we are not looking into uh, the physical safety. We will be more concerned with the psychological safety per se. I am Dr. Abraham Sir Isaac. I am a faculty at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So, let us start today's lecture with a theme. If you, as a leader, can own up to and demonstrate how you have learned from your mistakes, paves way for others. Now, this is interesting because as a leader, most of us tend to ignore or sideline or undermine our mistakes and we tend to behave in a way that nothing has happened. But when we are looking into ourselves as a leader or when we are having a leadership, certain leadership position or certain authoritative position, we have to understand one thing that there are a lot of subordinates, there are a lot of individuals who are actually trying to model your behavior, your way of doing things, how you interact with people. So that actually makes you more responsible than how authoritative you are. So basically responsibility should be side effect of that authority that, that comes to you. But unfortunately many leaders today actually are not able to take that responsibility in their hand and they are not able to actually deliver it or at least become a role model for the individuals in their organization. So let us understand this safety. When we look into safety, we generally think of physiological or let us say physical safety, maybe in a workplace condition, workplace safety, it is a standalone area in environmental safety standards and organization safety, etc. It is a standalone area in the HR, human resource management paradigm altogether. But today, I would like to discuss on psychological safety. Now, certain discussions in the previous module, if you have gone through that, you will understand that I have touched upon this concept of psychological safety. There I was more vocal about giving the right place or the right way or a right platform to express one's opinion. But psychological safety is more than that. What do you mean by a safe environment? A safe environment at work which can promote employee participation and engagement is psychological safety. Now, when you are looking into psychological safety from a narrow viewpoint, we will see that the moment you have ability or you have a platform to raise your voice, then it is psychological safety or it qualifies as psychological safety. But more than just raising your voice, it is about promoting the employee participation employee participation as well as engagement. So, recollect what we had discussed with respect to the engagement in the workplace. You might be an individual who has just joined the organization. You might be an individual who is new to the entire system. Maybe technologically you are, you know, naive or you are just new to the entire setup. So, there might be a certain bit of inhibition for you to ask somebody. There might be uh, some inhibition in actually, you know, discussing or, you know, there is an established group or team which takes care of the particular job. There might be some, some inhibition that you might feel that you go and approach them. How will they feel? Will it look bad? So, all these issues pertain to the voice. So, when you are actually trying to ascertain yourself or when you are trying to move up the ladder in the, in the organization itself, voice happens to be one critical thing. But for that voice to actually come out of you, you need to have psychological safety. Think of a situation in which the organization is uh, pretty much against, uh, you know, any democratic practices. The organization is mainly a top to down approach. It is a rule based approach. They are giving rule. You have to do it exactly as it is coming from the top. So, in such cases, there is actually 
zero psychological safety because neither the organization is warranting any opinion nor you are encouraged to actually talk. So it is neither there is extrinsic motivation nor there is intrinsic motivation because you understand that the moment you talk, the moment you raise a point, it might be valid, it might be the solution to the problem that the organization is facing, but still you will see that you hesitate, you don't have the courage to speak out because you have seen in previous cases, in previous experience that you know things have not gone according to what you thought or you were actually undermined or you were ridiculed or you will socially undermine. So all these aspects, all these counterproductive workplace behaviors which we have discussed categorically in module 11, you can or you must have observed in an organization when you have raised the voice. So that is what employee voice signifies. If you want to have or state your presence in the organization, it is a must that you should be in a position to raise your voice and you should actually be part of the decision making or at least articulate what you feel about a certain decision or a certain policy. So this safe environment hovers around the employee participation and moreover engagement. Let's say if you are detached from the particular job, uh, you yourself feel that you don't have the, the technical acumen to do something, you don't have the expertise or uh, you know proficiency in doing the particular job, then there is a chance that you might disengage yourself. In such cases, even if some brilliant idea strikes, it is unfortunate, but it happens, it is a truth, introspect within yourself, you tend to have a certain inhibition and you tend to retract yourself, you don't give or express your opinion or idea. Now this is what is counterproductive to the safe environment culture or what we call or understand as psychological safety. So when we are looking into psychological safety, please understand that Every single organization will become organization to work for. We have discussed in, in the previous module about, about autonomic motivation. So autonomic motivation comes in such situation when you are actually or you want to work for that organization and it is more of a pleasure than identified motivation. You don't think that this is a job and this is part of it and I have to do it whatever uh, the reasons be. Rather than that, if you are more autonomically motivated, if there is, there is intrinsic motivation, you tend to take a pleasure in doing that job or whatever activity you are given, whatever task you are given. You also take case of some cases where the task is interdependent, task is uncertain, complexity of task is there. We have discussed that in particularly in the previous module concerning knowledge hiding. In those situations when the task is bit uncertain, when the task is complex and you need to have certain interaction between the other team members, it is natural that you have to interact you have to raise your voice, you have to discuss, you have to deliberate. In those cases, if the organization is deliberately trying not to provide a safe environment, not to give a psychologically safe environment, then the organization is not going to produce any creative solution, any creative idea. So this is what I wanted to mention at the beginning itself. Psychological safety is a must. Psychological safety is essential for every single organization to thrive and perform and to have the competitive edge over, it com over its competitors. Now when we look into a context that is psychologically safe in one where people feel they won't experience interpersonal harm. So if I am in a situation where raising a voice or raising an opinion itself, there is a possibility that oh, uh, more than professional jealousy, there might be some interpersonal harm. It might not be uh, physical as uh, such, but there might be a possibility that uh, there might be some social undermining that may happen. There might be a possibility that some interpersonal harm like maybe your career progress in, within the organization is somewhat uh, stopped or ceased. So all these aspects may have the potential to cause interpersonal harm. So in all those situations, you cannot say that psychological safety is existing or there might be chances or possibilities of you being ridiculed or otherwise personally attacked. So if they try to speak up, make mistakes, take risks or ask to help, it is all a part of 
a clear voice, a, a high quality voice and that happens only when there is a psychologically safe environment. There is a lot of uh, very strong evidence that creativity, learning and exploration are better where psychological safety is higher. Now, this, this becomes critical for the simple reason that if you are in a innovative organization, you are in an organization which, which has a, a product of, uh, you know, the, the product is, so let's say, creative product or a process industry where some, some level of innovation or improvisation is essential. In those situations, if you are not in a position to actually provide psychological safety where they, they can point out the mistakes, if any, they can take risks or they can even ask for help if they don't know or they don't understand or they are not capable to do that alone. So that should be the environment how the organization should be designed. You know, we have macro B subjects like organization structure and design and all where we look into organization structure the organization culture which all comes under organization design. So it is not basically uh, you just make a hierarchy and say this is an organization or you don't prefer hierarchy, you go for a matrix structure and you say this is an organ. No, organization is never based on the hierarchy, it is always based on the people. That is why that is why organization culture becomes relevant. How you interact with others, how from what context you are coming and how adaptable you are with the existing culture that becomes relevant. How effectively or how cordially you are treating your co-worker that becomes critical. So all these aspects show one thing, the organization itself is based on its individual human resource. It is not this, just a structure that defines an organization, moreover it's the people. Let's take a case of an educational institution, who defines or who defines the quality of educational institution? It is not the authority, it is not the government, it is the, the, the set of students who are passing out. The, the, the products are students basically. So they will be the, the, the real stakeholders. They are the people who have come here for the education, benefited from the education and they are the people who will set the tone and tenor for what the organization or what the institution should be. You know, when, when institutions claim for a larger alumni base, they also strongly rely on them. Not because they want maybe some benefits like, let's say, let us be very frank with respect to some placements they can help or maybe with respect to some funding and all. But more than that, more than that, there's a reputation that is being built by the alumni base. There is some reputation or image of the institution that is being proclaimed or that is being established outside the world. That is more important. That is what is critical. So please understand, even in an organizational setup, psychological safety is of prime importance. And this is what uh, makes voice and high quality voice. Please remember our discussions on high quality voice. Somewhere we have discussed that strategic silence is important. Strategic silence is important for the simple reason that we want to see high quality voice. If you are silent, nobody cares. In fact, your, your boss would actually prefer, but at times they also want to hear not voice, high quality voice and please remember ladies and gentlemen high quality voice comes only when there can be a possible strategic silence in place so strategic silence could be a precursor towards high quality voice now let's look into psychological safety the importance of that when we have talked about psychological safety raising the voice you know expressing opinion taking risk you know showing that that's a problem or pointing it out or rectifying it, all these things were discussed. But let's dissect it and see what is the critical importance of or relevance of psychological safety in an organization. First and foremost, it encourages open communication. So when you look into an organization which is enclosed or let's say it's aloof from the outside world they do not know what are the changes what are what are the changes happening in the outside world and they are actually inherently disabled to adapt for the simple reason one that they don't know what is happening outside two if they do not encourage or motivate their employees to openly communicate 
there is another side of the coin where the organization is very strong, very robust, but you see that there is a developing uh, culture which is more of you know inward looking, more of hidden, more of uh, restricted environment. So there open communication takes a back seat. So when you are in an organization where open communication is not encouraged and open communication could be not only with respect to the same function, it could be cross functional. So when you are in an organization, let's say if open communication is not encouraged, there is a possibility that you need a solution from some other department. Please uh, recollect our discussions on uh, the task complexity, task interdependence, a real antecedent of knowledge hiding. When you are actually looking into actual uh, scenarios where you want to actually you know discuss something with respect to another department you need a, a so let's say a queue or a solution from another department that should essentially come or that will essentially come only when there is open communication in the in the organization otherwise the organization is not going to be making changes in a dynamic fashion. It might go in the old fashioned way and ultimately it might not be in touch with the realities of the present world and ultimately it will perish. So open communication has a clear relevance in terms of the organization psyche. Second most important aspect is it boosts employee engagement. Let's say uh, you as an individual within the organization, you are disconnected from what is happening in your unit or in your department or let's say in your in your functional team then you might not even feel of going to the office or going to the workplace consider another situation where there is somebody who is really motivated because he is always engaged with his job he is actively engaged with his job he he loves his job he he takes pleasure in doing that job so there is a possibility that if you have a psychological environment, you have a platform to discuss. If something is not happening according to what you feel or there is some, some lacune or there is some issue that you feel should be addressed, you can always open up, you can always take risk and you can always discuss this, deliberate this. But if you are not having such an environment where you cannot even raise your voice, you cannot even discuss things, then you are actually in a very unsafe environment. You do not have psychological safety in that particular organization and that essentially is a precursor for employee disengagement. So please understand, if you are a person uh, who wants to you know, discuss and deliberate and be open and vocal about your work, but in your organization, there are few chances or the organization is not actually encouraging that, then it is not a psychologically safe environment. Another important aspect is it promotes innovation and creativity. I've touched upon it briefly. When you are, you are looking into problems, in one of the lectures I had mentioned like modern problems require modern solutions. So when you are actually uh, having a psychologically safe environment, even your diversity, demographic as well as cognitive diversity is going to help you. But that will help you only if there is a psychologically safe environment. Let's say you have people from different culture. You have individuals coming from different cultural orientation, people with different child rearing practices, people with different experiences, people who have seen different, exposed to different culture, different workplaces, different industry, different sectors, they can all bring and you know assimilate that knowledge together. But that assimilation will only happen if you are actually ready to take that. If you are actually facilitating such a discussion, if you are not facilitating such a discussion, if you are not having that psychological safety, hardly a creative solution will come to a problem. It cannot be an innovative organization because you have not considered the opinion of the diversity. You have not considered the opinion of the diverse people who make the team. You are again going by the group thing. You are again going by decisions of a few who might not be in touch with the reality reality that is happening in outside world or who might not be technologically updated. 
There are possibilities. You can always relate with in your organization. There are few people who, who make a quotary or who make a, a, a nexus and they try to take decisions. But unfortunately, those decisions are not in line with the industry standards and the organization suffers badly. Had they asked you, or were you given a chance to raise your viewpoint? Had you got such a platform within the organization, this would not have happened. Recollect, you might have thought this in your mind itself. So please understand, those environments, those situations will warrant a psychologically safe environment. Another important aspect is it facilitates learning and development. Please recollect our discussions on mastery and performance climate. There are some organizations which promote mastery climate. There are some organizations which promote the performance climate. If the value of the organization is more aligned towards performance, if the value of the particular organization is more in line with performance, somebody you know coming uh, and you know uh, f uh, against you know somebody coming in and getting an edge over the competitor or co-worker, if that is the, the culture, the underlying culture, then there is an inherent competition in every single phase. Even within a meeting there could be there could be problems, there could be you know conflicts even within decision making that has done uh, th there could be deliberations against it and all this nexus could form and actually you know bring in negative forces against the organization so all this actually will not facilitate learning and improvement whereas some organizations which are dedicated on which are which have focused on mastery climate they tend to encourage their individuals or employees to actually learn they they facilitate training programs they understand that our employees lack in let's say these three or four factors let's put a, them under training for that and this is part of an incentive maybe this is part of a recognition it is never a ridiculing mechanism it is never an socially undermining mechanism it is part of you know accepting the fact that you know you need some some improvement in this and you are also happy as an employee the employer is also happy because there is a win-win situation happening but in those situations where performance climate is the orientation, then learning and development will not happen. Now look into such situations where you have a psychologically safe environment. Let's say you want to actually learn something new. Let's understand with a clear example. There is some new machinery that has come to your, your workplace. You have to get acquainted with that. Maybe you want to go for a training let's say in US or in Europe somewhere where the headquarters of the particular manufacturer is or they might be giving some training but it includes some amount of you know fund that is required and the organization need to pay that. Are you not getting a space to actually tell this? Are you not getting a platform to actually put this across the, the decision making authority? Whoever it is, it could be the head of the unit, it could be the committee who are, who are looking after the, let's say, execution or commissioning of the particular unit. Whoever it is, if you are not getting the real opportunity, real the chance to put across this opinion, then you don't have psychological safety. And the moment, if you have a chance, if you have a platform, the organization itself is facilitating such a platform you put across such options in front of them and the organization agrees to that then you actually develop a possibility of learning and development within the organization so please understand psychological safety is also critically important because of the fact that it facilitates learning and development another important aspect which which is seldom addressed is that it reduces stress and burnout we had clear discussions on stress as well as burnout specifically. Now, we generally don't talk about this, but many a time there are some individuals who feel depressed, dejected, and they are very sad after coming uh, from work. Uh, you know, the time they spend in home, they are, they are uh, you know, so much of uh, in depression for the simple reason that they, they think that you know the organization is not listening to them the decision makers are not listening to them there is a possibility that you can give you know some uh, uh, rectifications or some solutions but the organization or the decision making body is not taking care of that or not even giving them an ear or not even listening to them so such 
learned helplessness such issues that uh, you know you are not being heard even if you have a high quality voice this will create stress and stress will ultimately lead to burnout and the natural consequence is either it will take a physiological hit or you may have to leave the organization because you feel that you are not compatible to the organization. You do not belong there. There might be some inherent feeling that will develop like that. So please understand, psychological safety has its own importance. It has its own importance from uh, the point of view of open communication, in terms of employee engagement, in terms of innovation and creativity, in terms of learning and development, and in even in terms of stress and burnout. Now let's look into fostering psychological safety. We have understood what psychological safety is and what is the importance or the relevance of psychological safety in an organization. Now let's understand what can foster psychological safety and that's the theme of our lecture today. Psychological safety as we have understood, I'll take this uh, idea from this source which is Harvard Business Review article and Amy Edmondson says that psychological safety is a climate that we co-create sometimes in mysterious ways. So basically what happens is that when you are, you know, uh, there as an individual, you tend to in, or you need the support from your co-workers because many a time it is evident that you cannot do the work alone. You need input from your friends, your co-workers, your subordinates, maybe your, your boss, your superior, etc. So all these aspects needs to come in. All these employees and their valuable opinion should come in. There should be a cohesion. There should be an amalgamation of idea which can only lead to a creative solution. When you are looking into why employee voices matter, it matters because it encourages individuals to overcome the instinct of silence. Many a time individuals are in the realm of silence, they don't know. They generally feel that, okay, nobody has asked me, so I'm, I'm, I'm just remaining silent. Had anybody asked me, I would have definitely told, but unfortunately they remain silent and it is detrimental to the organization, there is no doubt about it. So it's crucial to establish an environment where their ideas are valued. The moment they feel that, you know, their ideas are encouraged, their ideas are valued, they feel uh, that they get an understanding or they get a feeling that they should speak up because their ideas are valued. The moment they feel that they are, they are belittled or they are actually socially undermined, they tend to remain silent. So clearly articulating the importance of the perspective and input reinforces the significance of their contribution. So sometimes the contributions might be very negligible, but sometimes the contributions might be in very large scale. But the thing is that if they are not recognized and supported and appreciated even for small contributions, they may get neglected and they may feel dejected and there is all possibility that they might not go for the larger contributions and they might stay away from, they might refrain from actually raising voice or they might actually refrain from actually stating very good suggestions or solutions to the existing problems or increasing the level of contribution. So emphasizing how it directly impacts the outcomes and success of collective work. So collective work is critical and collective work as I mentioned comes through a cohesion of individuals working as a team, working as a single unit. So by actively setting the stage for open communication. I have already underscored the relevance of open communication when it comes to psychological safety. So actively setting the stage for open communication, individuals are motivated to share their insights and enhance the overall collaborative process. So psychological safety is the precursor towards a collaboration, towards synergetic approach in organization, towards collective effort in an organization. You cannot advocate, you cannot preach or profess uh, collective effort and uh, you know synergistic approaches without providing an environment of psychological safety. Now let's look into uh, the fallibility. Please admit your own fallibility because to err is human. So from this point of view, if you look into uh, the fallibility angle, if you as a leader can own up, and this is our theme today, can own up to and demonstrate how you have learned from your mistakes. So many a times, leader, as an individual within an organization, you tend to hide 
your mistakes. You tend to ignore your mistakes. You tend to undermine or underplay your mistakes. But if you are in a position, if you are in an authoritative position and there are individuals looking up to you, then if you can own up your mistakes and demonstrate how you learn from your mistake, it generally paves the way for others. So it's important to model the behavior you want to see in your team and normalize vulnerability. Now this is critical. In the present day scenario, vulnerability is a common norm. But generally people tend to underplay it, tend to undermine it because they feel that the moment they are vulnerable, the others will be all over them. But unfortunately, that is a wrong understanding. You have to understand that being human, we all err, we all make errors, we all make mistakes. But the thing is how effectively you can bounce back, how effectively you can normalize vulnerability and model your behavior. Let others learn that as a leader, you are not perfect. You also make mistakes and based on that, if you can actually you know, motivate others, that would be what is the requirement or the need of the hour. So this includes things like being respectful, open to feedback and willing to take risks. Now, this is something which generally people stay away from. Being respectful, um, you know, nowadays we hardly see that in organization. We are not open to feedback. It is like one way channel we do and we are not going to listen to things because we don't think that we can make mistakes. So please admit your own fallibility. That will equip you a willingness or that will facilitate a willingness to take risks. Now let's look into how we can actively invite input because as I mentioned, feedback is an essential aspect in communication. So if you look into uh, all the sessions of communication, all the theories of communication, something which is very critical is the understanding of feedback loop. If the feedback is not given or not accepted, so either the party is not ready to give feedback or there is the receiver who is not ready to accept the feedback, in either of these cases, the communication channel breaks down. So ladies and gentlemen, please understand feedback is essential and how we can actively invite input becomes critical especially in the background of psychological safety so don't assume people will tell you what they are thinking or that they understand that you want their input so as, as it, you might not be in authoritative position let's say you are in a meeting within the organization let's say it's a morning meeting there's a team lead and there is some discussion that's going on but unfortunately there are some point that others want to raise but unless and until they are asked they won't tell it is natural for them to just keep mum so this is what you have to understand so you have to be proactive in those situations. You have to be pragmatic in these situations. Understand that it is natural that they will not tell. They might have hesitation in stating the point or they might be even doubtful with their opinion because they might think that I don't know whether this is going to work out or maybe I'll cut a sorry figure in front of the entire organization. I don't want that. Better to remain silent. So all these things might be running in the back of their mind. So please understand you have to take the lead. You have to explicitly request it. Please, team, tell us or tell me what we can do. So that explicit request makes things, you know, it breaks the ice. It makes things clear. It makes, brings clarity to the whole situation. You will be actually more enticed. You will be more happy to, you know, uh, tell those things or whatever ideas you are having or whatever suggestions you are having, your subordinates or co-workers might open up because you are explicitly seeking that. Unless and until you don't explicitly seek, perhaps they think that, okay, this guy does not need our suggestion or he is not even looking for our suggestions and why, why should we tell that? So please understand, situations or how to foster psychological safety, one of the critical reasons is explicitly request others' ideas, others' suggestions. Let others also feel that they are having a say in the organization. Let others also feel that their decisions or their ideas are also part of the decision making. Let others also feel that they are also included in every single decisions of the organization or every single meetings of the organization is not just another formality. So please explicitly request it. Maybe you can ask open-ended questions like what are you seeing? What are your thoughts on this? 
where do you stand on this particular idea so there there might be some initial hiccups people might not open up you act as a facilitator you act as the leader this is how the leadership emerges this is how the leadership evolves so you act as a leader ask them explicitly what are your thoughts on this how do you you know want to do this or what would be your stand on this or what do you think that if i do like this what would be counter strategy or what would happen against it so all these inputs they might have thought of it you might get better ideas no doubt as an experienced person having seen the organization you must have got some ideas of yourself but that does not mean that other ideas might not be useful you they might have a better high quality voice than you because they must have seen that from a different angle altogether you are too much carrying the recency effect maybe or you have the escalation of commitment i have discussed everything so that's why i'm just bombarding you with terms so you might have the escalation of commitment they don't have that baggage they don't have any other baggage with respect to uh, raising the opinion only thing is that you have to facilitate an open environment so that they talk they react and they communicate now respond productively now just explicitly requesting the feedback is not the only thing it is only the first part you have invited them you have asked them you have seek their opinion but please once they respond once they actually tell you or give you some suggestions or ideas please respond in a productive manner don't be dismissive don't be uh, too much of uh, uh, autocratic don't be uh, you know don't try to undermine them don't try to actually belittle them uh, suggesting that your idea is is a, a foolish idea or a stupid idea something like that so please respond in a productive manner productive manner is to respond in a sensible manner so you can tell you can basically tell people you want their input or it's okay to make mistakes but they won't do these things if they feel like they are being blamed or shut down so this is basically the moment let's say uh, you know th there could be a possibility that you are explicitly requesting and there is one person who is raising his or her voice then suddenly you tell that okay uh, you, you please i am not going to take your idea because last time you told something and it backfired so that is a clear case of a classical case of blaming so please don't enter into blame games please don't shut them down please don't undermine them let them tell let them come up with ideas when people speak up with a wacky idea or even tough feedback how do you respond that becomes critical be always appreciative and forward thinking bygones are bygones you don't have to look into what has happened in the past be appreciative that the fact that they have talked they have initiated the the discussion they have actually raised a valid point be a forward thinker replace blame with curiosity if they might have some idea respond productive in a productive manner you can respond and ask them okay uh, if that is the case then what could be the addendum what could be the next phase of execution something like which actually underscores your curiosity rather than blaming them be curious to the entire situation so if you believe you already know what the other person is thinking then you are not ready to have a conversation instead adopt a learning mindset knowing you don't have all the facts now this is particularly relevant in organization many a time we feel that individuals they tend to have a different opinion altogether when it comes to the decision making process they feel that they know everything they feel that they can understand everything and their decisions will be the best decision please do not live in such fool's paradise you might be only one individual there is a collective wisdom outside the boardroom there is a collective wisdom within the organization which has seen the thick and thin of the organization they know exactly what's happening in the organization right from the bottom to the top so you might not get a clear picture if you are trying to uh, not involve them so please understand avoiding such decisions such valuable suggestions would be a big mistake so that would work against the psychological safety which otherwise you are trying to provide so it's is it all about being nice now let me start concluding this i have talked vociferously 
I've articulated in in a very positive tone about you know about your voice and about the psychological safety. But does that mean it's all about being nice? I'll say creating a psychologically safe environment isn't about just being nice. It is not that you have to be a nice individual. No, it is much more than that. In fact, there are many polite workplaces that don't have psychological safety. Please remember, there are many workplaces such that because there's no candor. There is no absolute, you know, uh, honesty. There is no openness in those environments. They are all very polite. They are, they are not very aggressive. There are workplaces which take, you know, things very silently in a very uh, a meek manner, in a very silent manner. But there are no candor. There is no openness. There is no honesty. And people feel silenced by the enforced politeness. It is not aggression. It is not undermining. It is no force, no blaming. No ridiculing, nothing is happening, but excessive politeness, excessive enforced politeness. You feel that if I tell something, you know, they might feel bad. That level of politeness might set in. And again, it is doing the same thing, if you remember. If you, if you understand it clearly, it is doing the same purpose. It is, it is actually making you silent. It is forcing you to be silent. It is reducing the chances of your employee voice. So please understand, it is not about just being nice. Unfortunately, at work, nice is often synonymous with not being candid. So you are not in a position to actually tell. Because you have some barriers which are not visible, but it exists. So within those barriers, you cannot actually express your ideas. You cannot actually express your viewpoint. You have a stunning, a brilliant idea, a brilliant solution to the problem that they, they, they have in the hand. But the problem is that you feel that whether you might be, you know, uh, misunderstood or misinterpreted or maybe the raising the voice itself would sound impolite. So all these aspects pertain to uh, or actually show us one thing that it's all about not being just nice. So when you are looking into psychological safety, there are certain common misconceptions associated. You must feel comfortable in a psychologically safe environment. But that said, when you are looking into many individuals, they mistakenly believe that maintaining psychological safety requires constant comfort, thinking they must avoid saying anything that might make others uneasy. Something which we are discussing uh, just now, when we are looking into the excessive politeness. Excessive politeness, there is no candor. It makes the life uneasy. You have to say something, you have in your mind to say something, but unfortunately, you do not have the environment to say that. So that's simply not true. Learning and messing up and pointing out mistakes is usually uncomfortable. So being vulnerable will feel risky. The key is to take risk in such safe environment. So one without negative interpersonal consequences. Anything hard to achieve requires being uncomfortable along the way. I repeat, anything hard to achieve requires being uncomfortable along the way. So candor is hard but non-candor is worse. So please understand, that should be the clarity you have, you should have with respect to psychological safety. So that completes the entire course. I hope a very good journey of organizational behavior. Now, before concluding, I just want to quickly check on what we did. Quick recap of what we did in the entire 12 weeks. In the entire 30 hours, we have taken 60 sessions. Let's look back and understand what we have learned. We have traveled across 12 modules. The first module was to introduce you to organizational behavior. We looked into understanding organizational behavior where we traced into the evolution one and two. Then we moved to the individual in the organization. We understood the relevance of the individual within the organization. Though we had established what organization is, what organizational behavior management is, in the first two lectures, we had categorically summarized the importance of individual in the organization as the building block within the organization. Then within the first module, we moved to understanding, acknowledging and appreciating 
what individual differences are. So we took two lectures specifically on understanding and appreciating what individual differences are. Please remember, it takes all types of people to make the world. So we need to have a clear understanding of the individual differences. We need to understand every single individual within the organization will have a different mindset, will have a different predisposition, will have different attitudes, will dif have different personality. All these factors would actually make him all the more relevant for the organization. So before being dismissive, being shating on uh, a process of belittling him or her, always understand the relevance of individual differences and how it can actually bring in better workforce in your organization. So from the discussions from individual differences, we move to the module two, where we categorically discussed about the diversity and inclusion in the organization. So we looked into diverse workforce in lecture six and seven, where we looked into the inclusive mindset particularly. From that, we ventured into the understanding of perception of diversity. Please understand and please remember and recollect that diversity does not mean inclusion. You might perceive that there is diversity in an organization, but it might not be the inclusion that you actually want to see that is existing in the organization. Then we ventured into ableism and inclusion. Please understand one thing that a physically challenged person or a, a physically able, differently able person is not made physically challenged or not made physically disabled by, by let's say a wheelchair or such equipments. It is the lack of proper facilities given to him, lack of ramps given to him, lack of proper pathways given to him or her that makes him, uh, uh, you know, differently abled. So please understand, we understood this in ableism and inclusion. And finally, we looked into ways of how we can manage diversity. We looked into some of the strategic factors and some of the strategies that organizations incorporate for diversity management. So it should not be a peripheral diversity. It should not be only the demographic diversity. It should be also the cognitive diversity that we should look into. Then we move to the module three, where we looked into perception and decision making. We introduced you to the perceptual process. We understood what are the factors that influence perception per se. And we also tried to underscore the relevance of perception and decision making. How perception or your perceived behavior or your perception about certain situation, certain ideas, certain people are making an impact or influence on the decision making, how perception acts as an influential parameter in decision making. Then we ventured into what affects decision. We critically looked into decision making. We tried to understand all those factors which can actually have an impact on decision. Then we also looked into the ethical parameters or the ethical decision making process altogether. How in organization decision making is happening, but ethical decision making is not happening. We understood the actual flavor of ethical decision making with couple of case studies there. Then we ventured into module four, where we looked into the affect and emotions. Now affect and emotions, we categorically understood with the help of affective events theory. In lecture 17, we categorically understood what do you mean by affect, what do you mean by affective events theory. On the basis of the theoretical understanding, we tend to establish why emotional intelligence is critical and we also tried our attempt to understand stress. So this is what has correlated or may, may, maybe it has come for our help even in module 12, which we are discussed in just a few minutes ago. So when we are looking into effect and emotions, we concluded the module with emotions and moods. We tend to differentiate between emotions and moods. We try to understand the applications of emotions and moods. So don't be uh, hesitant in using emotions and moods. You can use your emotions and moods for the benefit or to excel within the organization. And we have discussed some tips regarding that too in module four. In module five specifically, we ventured into personality. We looked into what self is and we tried to understand what personality means. 
We also understood in lecture 22 what types and theories of personality are. We looked into uh, almost all the theories, trait theories and we almost looked into even other social theories as well. So we tried to understand how do different inventories work, how measuring personality is significant and how we can actually measure personality. We looked into various tests and personality based inventories in module 5 lecture 23. In lecture 24, we ventured into personality traits which are relevant to the organization. We looked into certain traits which make some individuals successful, some individuals a failure. What could be the reason we ventured into, if you, if you look into, if you recollect, we had looked into different theories including Big Five. We understood what is the relevance of openness, conscientiousness, extraversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, etc. We also looked into other trait theories and how certain personality traits are relevant to organization. Finally, we looked into in the last lecture of the module 5, that is lecture number 25, we looked into how we can assess personality. It is not about measuring personality, but assessing personality and specifically underscoring the caveats and concerns with respect to the assessment of personality. So that concluded the module 5. In module 6, we looked into work values at workplace. So the lecture number 26 was more on understanding values, the importance, the relevance of values in workplace. Lecture number 27 was all about sources and types of values. We tried to unders underscore what are the different types of values specifically. In the next lecture, we looked into values that cut across culture and we had a specific detailed discussion on person job fit and person organization fit. Two of the most important criterias which I have discussed across the co course in lecture 29 and lecture number 30. So person job fit and person organization fit is what we concluded in module 6 in values at workplace. In module 7, we ventured into motivational differences in individual, one of the key modules of the entire course. We understood what motivation is, what do you mean by motivation, what are the different types of motivation, intrinsic, extrinsic, how it emanates, what are the different ramifications of motivation, etc. In lecture number 32 and the second lecture of module 7, tracing the roots was what was our focus. We looked into the early theories. We also looked into early theories in lecture number 33. Now in lecture 34 and 35, we tried to look into almost all the contemporary theories that were part of or that led us to a detailed understanding on motivational differences in individual. So we uh, categorically covered the entire motivation, both theoretical as well as practical understanding in module 7 in this course. In module 8, we tend to make it in a more application oriented manner. We tend to understand the application of more motivation at workplace. We tend to design or devise or understand the motivation from a, from a practical angle, from a pragmatic angle. For that, we looked into different elements, different factors and for lecture number 36, the, the, the point of discussion was job design and job characteristic model. In lecture number 37, we looked into employee involvement, how an involved employee is more than just an employee who participates in things. Please understand, participation plus commitment is involvement. So when you are looking into an involved employee, how effectively you are venturing into an organization and how successful you are in an organization totally depends on the involvement of the particular employee. In lecture number 38 and 39, we looked into strategies, specific strategies for organization in motivating the employees, which can act as a, a reference load, a reference which can act as a reference slide for organizations itself to bring out, to bring out the best in those, in their employees or bring out the best in their workers. So motivating the employees and different strategies were looked upon in, in lecture number 38 and 39. And finally, we concluded the module 8 of motivation application at workplace by looking into organizational justice and employee motivation. Now finally, in module 9, we ventured into learning, one of the most critical aspects of learning 
or in the entire OB altogether, where we try to define learning and understand learning in an unequivocal fashion in lecture number 41. In lecture number 42, we try to understand how do individuals learn. Rather than going for an for a organizational angle, we tend to look into different mechanisms how individuals specifically learn. In lecture number 43 and 44, we looked into the theories of learning. All the theories, almost all the theories of learning were covered in lecture number 43 and 44. In lecture number 45, we looked or we took the learning into a practical point of view. Again, if you see that has been the, the entire scheme of things. As the modules progress, the last one or two lectures would be more practically oriented. So, following the trend in lecture number 45, which was the last lecture of module 9, we looked into learning in an organizational setting. So, rather than just beating around learning and how individuals learn or the theories of learning, we tend to become pragmatic. We try to become pragmatic. We try to bring in learning in an organizational setting with lecture number 45. Then we move to module 10 and lecture number 46. Module 10 was all about creativity, psychological capital and mindfulness. So we started with the module with lecture number 46, understanding creativity. We distinguished creativity with other behaviors which are usually misunderstood with that. We tried to bring in the different factors or understand those factors which actually are relevant in creativity and how creativity is vital in organization. Lecture number 47 discussed on the stages of individual creativity. Every single individual might be creative, but there are some stages which are forgotten, which are not taken into consideration. In lecture number 48, we looked into a specific topic of creativity and problem solving. So we had looked into different cases also in most of the modules and creativity and problem solving had been a vital creativity and problem solving becomes one of the most critical lecture within the module 10. Then we ventured into lecture number 49 where we tried to define psychological capital. Psychological capital was defined and understood clearly when we ventured into lecture. Then we ventured into lecture number 50 using psychological capital we tried to understand what exactly do you get from mindfulness and what do you get from the creativity and psychological capital. Then we ventured into the last two important modules which were uh, improvisation in the entire course which was termed as knowledge sharing and hiding module 11 and module 12 which was again employ voice and silence. So as a caveat I already mentioned, till creativity, psychological capital, we had some backup from textbooks. We had learned there are some courses which are actually discussed on that or th there are everyday things which are generally written or codified on aspects till module 10. But from module 11, things were evolving. We have made use of extensive use of sound empirical research, some of the research that we do here at IIT Guwahati and also part of knowledge hiding and then we are also looked into some of the contemporary research that has happened. So most of the background work was done with respect to, with the help of, with the aid of sound empirical research. So as part of module 11, we looked into knowledge sharing and hiding. So lecture number 51 looked into understanding knowledge sharing. We tend to understand first what you mean by chaos, what in, in knowledge management, why knowledge sharing is getting the, the importance and not knowledge hiding. And lecture 52 was all about understanding knowledge hiding, a clear understanding of what it is and what it is not, where we also looked into, we combined this lecture and looked into individual factors affecting knowledge hiding. So lecture 52, 53 looked into knowledge hiding specifically. I tried to bring in a, a decent understanding about knowledge hiding, why organizational politics out of the entire uh, activities or strategies revolving around organizational politics, why, why specifically controlling knowledge is significant? Why controlling knowledge is taking the center stage? And why out of the entire scheme of things, like even absence of knowledge sharing, knowledge hiding, knowledge hoarding, why knowledge hiding is becoming more, more critical within the organization. We also try to understand how knowledge hiding is different from other counterproductive workplace 
uh, or counterproductive workplace organizational behaviors. We also looked into in lecture 54 how we can integrate knowledge sharing and hiding behaviors. Because in organization both of these exist and many a time we are myopic in seeing the knowledge hiding. We, are, we sometimes acknowledge the fact that you know our knowledge management system is not working fine but we tend to undermine or we tend to neglect the fact that there is a diametrically opposite construct which is knowledge hiding and we tend to forget to acknowledge that and that brings the all that brings all the issues. In lecture 55 it was the last lecture of in lecture 55 which was the last lecture of module 11 we looked into strategies for individuals to foster knowledge sharing. We categorically looked into how, uh, those strategies, those points where we can actually nurture and develop knowledge sharing as a, as a good practice, as a, as a best management practice within an organization. So how to tackle knowledge hiding and how to focus on knowledge sharing specifically was the intent in lecture number 55 the last lecture of module 11. Finally, we move to the last module. In the last module, employee voice and silence, in lecture number 56, we tried to understand employee voice and employee silence. We tried to define what is employee voice, how it is different from uh, other workplace behaviors. We try to understand what is employee silence, how is it different from knowledge hiding, how is it different from knowledge hoarding. We try to bring in such subtle understanding in lecture number 56. In lecture number 57, we looked into individual factors affecting voice behaviors. We try to, we try to look into those situations or those cases where we can make the quality of the voice effective or higher. We we looked into the factors affecting silence in lecture number 58 and we also tried to understand the scenario where silence can be strategic, where silence can be important. Finally, we concluded with strategies for fostering safe environment at work. So this was the last lecture where we looked into all the strategies, most of the strategies which can foster safe environment at work. So this completes our entire scheme of things. We, we tried to cover 12 modules, almost 60 lectures, all portions of organizational behavior in a comprehensive fashion. We tried to add some inputs specifically with respect to uh, the cases and moreover from sound empirical research we have taken some inputs as well. So when we look back this is what we have learned. So that concludes the entire organizational behavior course. I hope that I have shown justice to this particular course. But before I conclude, I will just try to uh, conclude it one simple statement. How we are is defined by basically how we perform in an organization. We may have n number of problems, n number of issues, n number of personal uh, choices to make. But in the end, if you are not working for the organization, if you are not working for the goals of the organization, you might be deemed as a failure and you are in fact a failure. Organizational behavior management, though it starts with individual, it starts with interpersonal relationship, it ends in organizational goal. Many a time in, in the quest to see the, the individual trees, we don't appreciate the forest. So please try to see that you have got a good organization, you are working for a good organization or you may get a good organization sooner. But are you worth for that particular organization? You might make big claims before entering in the organization. But once you enter into the organization, are you doing justice to the organization? That defines what you are as a person, as, a, as, as an individual and as an employee. So that will be all from my part. See you. Uh, with another course some other time. Thank you for listening to me patiently. Namaskar. Mm -hmm.